Thank you, thank you. All right, all right. Thanks, thanks everybody for coming. I know it's a, you know Monday night. It's been a, a big, busy weekend and uh, with really fabulous weather. So I really appreciate everybody being here tonight. Uh, we think that we have a really great lineup for you, and we're really excited to present this Let the Games Begin uh, event. Um, and uh, in addition to thanking you all uh, and uh, and our panelists, I wanted to thank the San Francisco Giants. <laughs> because they won it in four, we don't have to compete with them tonight. There would have been 10,000 people four blocks away taking all these parking places, so we're super happy that the Giants were able to sweep in, in the four games. So I wanted to thank them really quickly. And then just jump into what we're here to talk about tonight. And as I mentioned, we've got some fabulous panelists, so I'm really excited to introduce them. I'm going to turn it over really quickly, but I wanted to kind of uh, set an agenda of what we're talking about here and why we're talking about transmedia and storytelling. So when we define what transmedia is, we really put content and story at the center of the equation. So everything for us is building the story world around the technology. And if you caught any of the little animation that we had going before, we talk about Transmedia SF where storytelling meets technology. So for us, story is a, is a crucial element in what we're looking to create when we create a story world that we consider Transmedia. And so why is story really that important? It's actually essential to our brains. Neurologists now with functional MRI and PET scans have discovered that humans are uniquely wired for story. When we hear stories, it's actually as if we're experiencing it. That the, the areas of the brain that light up are the same areas that light up when you're experiencing an event. So stories actually, you know, uh, are, are just uniquely human in our world. They enhance recognition and cognition. They enhance meaning and empathy. Uh, and it's really one of the most powerful forces that we as humans have created over the millennium. So when we look at story, you know, from a traditional narrative perspective, and I come from a film background, so this is from, you know, a, a well-known tome on story that there are eight essential characteristics of story, and Joseph Conrad breaks it down into, you know, there's, there's uh, order, chaos, and resolution, right? And that's your story arc, and all of the ways that we plant story as a traditional narrative. A lot of these um, are up for grabs when we're talking about an interactive environment, and particularly in games, right? Where, where the onus on the game developer is to create a fun and engaging interaction. So how do you create a narrative with its traditional form, and how do you use this narrative in storytelling in a very dynamic and engaging and interactive format, such as games? So it's a, it's a question that is going to be answered by our three uh, esteemed panelists tonight. And without further ado, I'm I'd like to introduce them, and then we'll, uh, we'll get this panel started. Uh, so first we have Eric Lindstrom, who is a senior partner at Ludus Labs. Eric uh, has 30 titles to his name. He's been in the business for 25 years. He's made such well-known titles as Tomb Raiders and, uh, and other things that you will all have been familiar with. Uh, in addition to Eric, we have Jordan Blackman. Uh, Jordan has spent time at Ubisoft and at Zynga, uh, and he's just recently started up his own media company called Wander Media. Uh, in addition to uh, Jordan, we have Marty Kaplan. Uh, Marty is uh, at EA BioWare, has 18 titles to his name, uh, and spent some time designing games for the CIA, which is kind of interesting. So we're looking forward to hearing a little bit about Marty's spin on the whole storytelling thing. Uh, so uh, let's give them all a warm welcome. Thank you, everybody. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Eric Lindstrom. Let's see if the microphone works. How's that? Is that my voice or the speaker voice? A little both. A little both? Yeah, there you go. That's better. Better. Yeah. Excellent. Definitely all right, well, uh, yes, I'm Eric Winstrom at Lewis Labs. Um, what we do is we uh, bring about 60 years of experience in designing video games, both production and design, uh, to make uh, games from fun games to successful games. 
one of those pieces is this concept of uh, attachment and context and narrative. So that's what I talk about today. But um, given the short amount of time that Beth has us speaking, uh, I had a clear choice. I could either pick one topic and cover it adequately, or a lot of topics and cover it inadequately. So naturally, I'm picking the latter choice. And we're going to see how fast we can do this. <laughs> Should video games have stories? So before you think it's that conversation, this is not the right question. This is the wrong question to ask. And it's important why that's the wrong question to ask, and that's what I want to talk about. But first, I'm going to answer it. Yes, of course they should. Everyone knows why stories are good. That's introduction told us a lot of why stories are good on a neurological basis, not only psychological and emotional, but it adds all kinds of value, it adds all kinds of depth, it adds all kinds of lots of stuff. And no, they definitely should not be in video games, because stories get in the way, they cause all kinds of problems with interactivity, hardcore games hate them, they are antithetical to each other. So the reason that this is the wrong question to ask is because the yes and the no answers don't share a definition of story. The yes people think it's one thing, and the answer is yes. The no people think it's something else, and the answer is no. So let's not spend too much time in academics. Let's just use some examples. This is a fun game without a story. It's just a jigsaw puzzle in real time that you can lose if you run out of time. There's no elements of story at all. There's barely even a picture to this jigsaw puzzle unless you think multicolor random rectangle picture, which some people do, of course. But. So, uh, when did stories come into video games? Another wrong question to ask, because of this definitional thing that I'm, I'm talking about. Mid-1970s, Lunar Lander, I love this game. It's got setting, it's got conflict, it's got a sequence of events, it's got a resolution. Depending on how you define it, you can even have characters. This has all the pieces that are the most fundamental building blocks of narrative. Space Invaders came later in the 70s. This is all a decade before <laughs> Texas. This has got a protagonist, the defender, and all the antagonists. It's got scope, it's an invasion. It's a story. And Donkey Kong. This is when you get it all. This is Joseph Campbell all over the place. You've got the nemesis, you've got your love interest, you're overcoming obstacles, and you're not just playing the game, you're out to defeat that guy. You're out to save her. You're out to overcome these things that he's throwing at you, and you get angry with him. This is all emotion. He runs off with her again. It's great stuff. <laughs> But some people that I tell this to say, okay, come on. <laughs> These aren't really stories. This is just rapid paper. Well, the first thing they say is, there's no dialogue, it can't be a story. They usually immediately realize that that's not a valid argument. There are plenty of stories in many different forms of media that don't rely on dialogue. It's the context that's the storytelling. The context is what's really important. That making Donkey Kong look like that instead of like that is only storytelling. That is exactly the same game. You're spraying, you're jumping over these green discs that are rolling down these planes, and that green square where all these little circles are rolling out of, that's just the generator, and gives you a safe spot to jump onto out of harm's way, which is exactly what the lady is doing. Giving you a place to jump up, constitute your safe end, where you're out of the line of fire of the gorilla, who is not even in this game. You don't need the gorilla. All of these pieces is just emotional pain. And people don't want to play this game. <laughs> they want to play that game. And even the hardcore gamers that say that they don't like story, they want to play that game. 
because it has all these emotional attachments and meanings that work on a primal level, whether they want to admit it or not. But in their defense, when they complain about story, they're not complaining about that. They're complaining about something else. But that wrong question, should video games have stories? Yes, they can almost not help have stories. You have to actually work very hard to make a game that does not have a story. Humans don't think that way. There are stories out there. I mean, there are games out there that do not have more than just triangles jumping over serpent. One of the popular games in Icon is actually this impossible game where you're triangle jumping over squares. But for the most part, stories are an intrinsic part of video games. Except, like I said, everything that they say, people that hate stories in video games, is true. Because of exactly what they're talking about. When they do not like the way storytelling is integrated into video games. But let's, let's talk about these specifically, because that's really the challenge of interactive stories. These are the most common complaints that you hear from the hardcore gamers. The dialogue and cutscenes are corny. Um, for context, the cutscenes are these sequences that you play the game for 10 minutes and then suddenly it all comes to a dead stop. You watch a little movie, gives you some plot, gives you a reward, on you go back to the regular game. Stupid and corny. Linear plots are not compatible with open world environments. The player can go and do whatever they want, can't tell in the story with story beats, the beginning and middle and end. And the cutscenes interrupt the gameplay. And the story version of game events contradicts my personal version of what's going on. And I wish I could talk about that some more. I wish I could talk about every one of these slides for another half an hour each. But that one is the trickiest one because when you're talking about a scene where you're playing a game for an hour and then you see 30 second cutscene of the plot, and then you play for another half an hour, and then you watch a minute of cutscene. 95% of the experience is you and the game constructing your own narrative by taking the events and putting it together in a way that pleases you. And then suddenly, your character starts talking, and they're saying things that you weren't thinking. Reasons that you didn't have for shooting so and so. And that disconnect is often what makes uh, even non-hardcore gamers want to skip these interstitial movies. So really these things break down into two categories. That there are storytelling techniques that transcend specific media type, venue. It's strong character, it's conflict, these things that are universal to the story no matter where you are. Some of those things were all all of those work in video games. Um, <coughs> but there are some things that are not universal that are specific. And they do work in video games. <coughs> bad dialogue is, is pretty specific. There's no excuse for bad dialogue no matter where you're. But there are some things that just do not work well in interactive experiences at all. And one of those is trying to take a film and a game and splice them together like shuffling it up the cards. So that's, that's the two categories. There's stuff that should work in video games and currently doesn't because it's being executed poorly. And the other is there are conflicts between narrative and interactivity that have not been solved. Which I don't feel that bad about, by the way. I mean, if you remember, Citizen Kane came, what, 40, 50 years after the film started? And all the great things that came out of that in terms of filmic language? I mean, the fact that Movies were being made for 40 years before that stuff came around. Gives me hope, because these games have all been around for about 40 years. So let's go back to history a little bit and talk about how new venues, new media, gave rise to new opportunities and new challenges. When it was just you know, the old guy sitting on the campfire telling you a story and it's all him, when that evolved into multiple storytellers taking specialized roles on a stage where we could actually have some representation of, of environment, 
new opportunities arose. We had actors that specialized. We had sex to, sets to contextualize the action. But there was a new challenge that didn't exist before, and that was the audience was more distant from the storyteller. And some of the solutions were dramatic cosmetics so that faces could read it at the cheap seats. The concept of, of having to project your voice so that everybody in the back could hear you even though you were whispering in terms of what the dramatic scene was requiring. And that was a talent that actors had to develop to project, but actually be conveying an intimate emotion. And then film came along, there were some years that passed with it, and some of the opportunities were closer to the, uh, the real world that people live in, not just sets, but actual filming on location, various effects, and especially film editing, the idea that you could take whatever image you want, splice it together to make your sequence however you want. But the challenge that came that was completely new was this concept of people getting disoriented by the juxtaposition of various types of camera cuts. And that, you know, that's a whole degree program. But here's an example. Just don't cross the line. The 180 degree rule, when you're doing two shots, so that people can look at the screen and they can track the action in such a way that they don't get disoriented, they understand what's going on in ways that really weren't even meaningful to people before the concept of film and film editing was invented. Video games came and gave us this new opportunity, this, this increased participation and involvement in what's going on with these characters, these events. It brought people in to the action in a more intimate way that we're still trying to figure out exactly what that means on the various psychological levels that people interact with narrative. And the challenge is that by giving all of these freedoms to the participants of this interaction, the audience, the players, you actually have a, a very reduced ability to craft the experience, to choreograph the sequence, to even determine the sequence. And the way to fix that, to turn that strength into, or weakness into a strength, is that's not me actually not finishing the slide, it's that we don't know yet. There's a lot of things that we have figured out, and that would be a great other night topic. In fact, maybe the other speakers will fill in the gap because I'm trying to cover too much ground. Um, but this idea that people connect to what's on the screen differently when they are an active participant is a key piece. So I wanted to quickly go back to the list of the complaints that uh, the people that said no to storytelling in, in games were complaining about. And I'm not doing these in order of importance, I'm doing them in order of simplicity. If your dialogue and cutscenes are stupid and corny, that's because you're not hiring writers to write nice scenes. This is separate from the fact that you shouldn't have cutscenes in the first place. But if you've got dialogue in your game and it's crappy, that's not interactive's fault. That's not a clash of culture's fault. It's just, it's just uh, when video games started, the programmer did all the art, which was not a big deal when your art was a grid of 64 white dots, and you decided which ones to turn on and which ones to turn off. That was something that, you know, the Venn diagram of what an artist could do and what a programmer could do had a lot of overlap. Now, they don't overlap at all. Storytelling and writing is just on that same track further down the line. Linearity. Uh, this is a common complaint. People talk about the, the non-linearity of player-driven experience and the linear nature of narrative. And I wish I could get into this some more, but it's simply not as incompatible as, as people often are afraid of. Uh, sometimes the answer is a lot more work. One of the first games I ever worked on back at Electronic Arts in the early 90s, um, I did a branching dialogue system for a real-time simulator. And in the end, I wrote about 40,000 words. Any given player probably read 
10%. And that represents a huge production waste cost in current production thinking. But I did that at night and on weekends in about 10 days. And it wasn't Pulitzer material, but it was a lot better than the average crap you're reading in other games. And that put it a notch above, and it was noticed in the press. And it just came down to a simple methodology of delivering the content in a logical way that adhered to narrative construct rules and accepting the fact that you were not writing a great American novel. You were writing scenes. The math was putting the scenes together in correct ways and accepting the fact that any given person that you're connecting with is only going to consume a percentage of the content. Which is fine. Get over Point of view, this is that um, my personal version doesn't match the version presented to me. Um, Another way to say that than what I previously spoke about was this idea that um, when you're playing Superman, for example, or if you're playing you know, Gordon Freeman, or any other non-character where the player is supposed to be imagining they're in the scene, they're the ones running around these quarters, they're the ones pulling the trigger, they're the ones doing these things. And people that really like that don't enjoy as much being another character and letting them do all the talking. But just like there are movies that are successful that are comic book characters and some that are more, you know, everyday guy in an extraordinary circumstance, a lot of it does come down to personal preference. It's not just an interactive problem. And cutscenes. Um, I think I was going to talk more about this, but I'm just not going to. Cutscenes are just a bad idea. <laughs> and I've made a lot of them. Um, what it is, is a, a belief that a movie, because of its visual nature, is what narrative is. And when you're making a game, which is like a movie, it's on a screen, it's visual, it's, it's people and voices and all of these things, it's just too easy to fall into that attractor of make a movie and intercut it with interactive. And it's just, it's just the wrong approach. And it's great to see the industry has been moving away from that more and more. But it's got a long way to go. Oops. So, um, this diagram isn't about what's better. This is about, this is about complexity. <coughs> As you go from novels to theater to film to video games, you get more capabilities, you get more opportunities, you get more tools, and you get more challenges. You get more problems that film has had a hundred years to be solving, and they're still working on new ways to address a lot of these ways that people can attach to what's going on on the screen. And we're only just beginning, but there's plenty still left to do to figure out how human psychology reacts to what's going on on the screen. And here's a quick example. When you're watching a James Bond movie, are you just watching him? Are you sympathizing with his motives? Are you empathizing with his feelings? Are you actually pretending I'm him? Is that changing every time that the scene changes with every cut? That is a pretty hard problem to think about in film. As soon as you let the player hold the controller and they're steering where you walk, where you shoot, whether you shoot, not to mention choosing what you may or may not say, that has huge implications on the way people feel about the interaction. That's why people are so upset when guys on the screen say the wrong thing. Because they are able to construct their own experience so much more by playing the game than people do by watching the movie. Which is still going on. There are plenty of movies that are very underplayed and you have to figure out what you think those characters are feeling. And very often that is, how would I feel if I was that person in that situation? And how does it play out? It gets much more complicated with interacting. 
So this I took right from Wikipedia. I didn't even change how you spell theater. So a narrative is a constructive format. Okay, the game's already there. I didn't put it there. And it is the Latin verb to tell, but related to skill. And that is where I want to end. That's this idea that interactive brings so many challenges in terms of understanding the reaction of human psychology as it relates to participation and to apply that knowledge skillfully. And that's where the industry needs to continue to move. Not just understanding the new challenges, but to apply people that have the expertise to make choices that audience respond to positively. All right, well, thank you very much, Eric. That was great. Uh, and I have to say, uh, Eric uh, and I spoke for a couple of hours, and the depth of his knowledge is just really amazing and mesmerizing. And he really could do uh, in, in depth courses on any one of these subjects. So after our other presenters, we'll be all up for a panel. So think about what, you're, what questions that you want to ask Eric and our other presenters as we're going on now with the evening. And uh, we'll definitely be bringing Eric back for another presentation with us. Um, up next is going to be Gordon, uh, I'm sorry, Jordan, Jordan Blackman. And Jordan 